spring has sprung, and uh, I was talking with some folks back there before we got started this morning, and, and I, I know it's, and it's not summer yet, but doesn't it seem really dry? I mean, we, I think, I, I fear we're in for a very warm summer. Yeah, it was like it was zero. So anyway, uh, here's a tip from the pastor. Drink lots of water. Stay hydrated. It's very, very dry, and it's only going to get warmer. So how many of you know what the fruit of the Spirit, fruit of the spirit is? Okay. I, I just I, I want to read something to you real quick, okay? But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. That's an interesting phrase to end that section. Against such there is no law. There's no law against being gentle. There's no law against being loving. There is no law against being peaceful or patient or, or practicing self-control. There are nine of these fruits of the Spirit. The very center... Number five, sandwiched in, kind of like the, the stuffing of an Oreo cookie, is the word kindness. Kindness, being kind. How many of you know who Glenn Campbell is? Glenn Campbell was a country singer that died a few years back, and he had a number 23 hit in the, the Billboard um, Hot 100 called Try a Little Kindness. It was like number three in the country charts. And, and I was lis listening to that song this week. And it's like, you know, in 1969, they were asking the same questions that we're asking today. And they were, they were acknowledging the, the, the same lackings that we have today is that we just don't know how to be kind anymore. You know, I, I, I say this a lot. Be nice. <laughs> be nice to your brother. Be nice to your, your parents. Be nice to the, the waiter or the, the cashier at Walmart. Be nice. But I've come to realize that that's the wrong terminology for the church. Because when you're being nice, that's, that's really so that other people will see that, oh, this guy's not a bad person. But when you're kind and when you, when you display kindness as, as a believer then you're being Christ-like. Because we serve a God who is kind. We serve a God who is loving, who is just. And in our, the very act of our salvation, he displayed kindness to us that we honestly can't even grasp or fathom. Because we have no right to claim a relationship with God apart from his making it possible for us to receive that relationship. And so the very center of the fruits of the Spirit is this idea of stepping outside of yourself and into someone else's circumstances, someone else's lives, and impacting them with an act of kindness, not because you're a good fella or a good lady, but because you're a child of God. I was reading a, a letter that someone had posted, and if I were to say her name... Many of you would, would know who she was. But she ended her letter. Um, and let me back up just, just a tad. She was kind of telling her history. She'd gone through a lot of things. And she was distraught. She was beside herself. She was, she was all of these things. And she ended her letter with this. She said, maybe we could just be kind to one another. She dealt with depression, suicidal attempts. And her statement at the end of that letter was maybe we should just could be just be kind the lord is kind i want if you have your bible if you would turn actually actually can i just ask you to just listen and they'll, they'll put the they'll put ruth chapter one on the screen it's ruth chapter one if you want to read along that's fine too but i want to give us a couple examples this morning of what true kindness look, looks like. Because in our winner-takes-it-all world, a lot of times kindness is what gets left by the wayside. And when you leave kindness on the wayside, you leave love. 
When you leave love and kindness by the wayside, you leave mercy and you leave self-control and you, you, you leave patience and, and you leave those things that, that mark who we are as Christians. And so in the first, cha first chapter of Ruth, it came about, this is verse 1, came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to reside in the land of Moab. That is not Utah. With his wife and two sons, the name of the man was Elimelech. And his wife, and then the name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Ma Ma Malon and Chilion, um, Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judah. So they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons, for they took them for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of one was Orpah, the name of the other was Ruth. And they lived there for about ten years. Then both of the sons died, and the woman, were le and the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. But she had two, two daughters-in-law. I'm going to just tell you the rest of the story, and then I'm going to read a section. So they're in a foreign land because there's a famine in Judah. For some reason, God in his sovereignty and in his wisdom uh, allowed the men of the family to die. And women in that day, in that era, they, they lacked for everything. If you were a widow, your community was supposed to take care of you. Uh, you would say your church, if that would be, but it would be your religion your people would take care of you. Orpah and Ruth were Moabites, so they weren't even Hebrew. They weren't Jews. And Naomi discovers that there's, there's food. There's food somewhere else. There's food in Judah. So I'm going home to Judah, the mother-in-law says. She implores that her two daughters-in-law stay where they belong stay in Moab with, because that's where their families were. They would be fed. They would be cared for. They could get another husband. Naomi was way past the age of getting another husband. But she wanted her daughters-in-law to have a life that she could not give them and that because their husbands and the husband's father, they all, all died, there was very little hope. And so we see two kinds of Two acts of kindness in this. The number, first one is, is Naomi imploring Orpah and Ruth, go have a life. I do not want you to think that I'm going to constrain you and to keep you because what's best for you is, is, is to go. Naomi would say, I will fend for myself. So the first act of kindness that I see in this is a mother-in-law who's willing to sacrifice everything so her, her son's wives could actually survive and maybe thrive. And she, Naomi will not stop imploring them to leave. And, and Orpah finally agrees, I mean, I'm sorry, to stay. Uh, Orpah finally agrees to stay. But Ruth, Ruth, let me read verse 14. And they raised their voices, this is Orpah and Ruth, and they wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. Return, to you, return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said this, Do not plead with me to leave you or to turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. Where you sleep, I will sleep. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Where I die, where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and worse, if anything but death separates me from you. So that would be the second act of kindness. For Ruth to go, it doesn't matter what happens in my life. Without me, without help, strong mother-in-law, Naomi, you will die. You have no one back home to take care of you, so they thought. And so I am going to, to, to show you that I love you, to show you that I'm committed to you, to show you that I learned something by the way you treated your, 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 your sons and your husband and, and me and, and Orpah. 
And so the act of kindness is simply to say, um, Naomi, you mean more to me than I mean to myself. And I'm going to do all that I need to do for you so that you survive. See, kindness is this idea of, of wanting some better for someone else than you necessarily want for yourself. It's doing something not because you have to, but because you want to and because you feel compelled by God a lot of times that that needs to be your act. That needs to be the action that you take. To be kind, to, to display kindness, to not give up on people, to not look at someone who's different than you, who, to not look at someone who, who, who behaves differently than you do and, and, and scorn them and push them away, but to embrace them and to love them the best way that you know how. Jesus shows this in Mark chapter 5. So if you, now if you have your Bible, if, you, if, if you'd like to turn. And what I want to, well, I'm just going to read it. Because you, you're going to think I'm, I'm going to focus on one thing and I'm not. Oh, you probably will. I'm not a mind reader, I don't know. But I do know this, that we often miss the small things. And oftentimes the small things are the most important things. And so let me read this. In verse 21 of Mark chapter 5, when Jesus had crossed over again in the boat to the other side, a large crowd gathered around him and he, and he stayed by the seashore. And one of the synagogue officials named Jairus, Jairus came and, be, and upon seeing him fell at his feet and pleaded with him earnestly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Please come and lay your hands on her so that she will get well and will live. And he went off with him, and a large crowd was following him and pressing in on him. A woman who, who had had a hemorrhage for 12 years and had endured much at the hands of many physicians had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but instead had become worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched his cloak, for she had been saying to herself, if I just touch his garments... I'll, I'll get well. And immediately the flow of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And immediately Jesus, perceiving in himself that power from him had gone out, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see this crowd pressing around in on you, and you say, Who touched me? But he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be cured of your disease. If you had to guess what the most important word in this passage of Scripture was, would you have thought it was daughter? Jesus is going to help a pious religious man and a synagogue official whose child is near death and whose child, well, you probably know the rest of the story. And in the middle of this, in, in the middle of Jesus going to perform a miracle, going, going to do what Jesus always does, and that's to heal and to fix and, 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 and to do for others, to, to display kindness, to, to show mercy, to display peace and to usher peace into people's lives and, and, and into circumstances. So he's making his way and someone touches the hem of his garment. And because Jesus is Jesus, when that woman touches the hem of his garment, there is power that flows out of Jesus into her by the power of the Holy Spirit or something. But she is healed. And Jesus recognizes that something has happened. And so he turns around and looks, and, and I just read it, so we all know. And all of a sudden, his eyes lock on this lady. And this lady, knowing that something has happened to her, comes clean with Jesus. 
And, and here's where the story comes together, is they probably lock eyes, and maybe for the first time in 12 years, someone says something kind to, to, her, to her. He says, daughter. It's the only time Jesus ever used that word to speak to, some, to a woman. It's the only time that we see the power of one word in someone else's life. I mean, think about it. She spent all of her money trying to be healed. It said she was basically broke. She'd been to doctor after doctor after doctor, physician after physician after physician, and she was not well, so she was broke and she was sick and she was without hope. She was without options. I mean, some of you have experienced that. You've spent so, so many hours and so many days and so many months and years going to doctors to trying, trying to figure out how to, how to get well. You know how frustrating that is? A lot of you do. Or maybe you've walked hand in hand with someone that is, was going through something like that. There's little hope when nobody has any answers. Or so we think. But here's what I, I don't want you to forget is there's always hope in Jesus. There's always hope in Christ. There's always hope in God because who in the world ever would have thought that touching the cloak of Jesus would have changed their lives? None of us. We don't think that way. But desperation in the life of this lady that had this blood disease who, let me just paint this picture to you. She was not allowed in public without saying, I'm unclean, unclean. She could not have relations with her husband. She could not be in the same house of any, in same room or same house or anywhere. So she was breaking the law just being in the crowd. She had no life. She was unclean. The religious leaders didn't want anything to do with her. The, the public wanted nothing to do with her because anything she touched became unclean. She had no one, and she had nothing. And Jesus, in that one act of kindness, of recognizing her, of giving her a name, and showing her kindness, changed her world. And if we're to be like Jesus, and we are, then we have to follow his example of being kind in every situation, in every circumstance. I was reading the news this week, and I, I told Diana this morning, he said, I, I gotta stop. I gotta stop reading because it breaks my heart to see how unkind and how un, uncivil our, our world is, has gotten to be. When, when we are willing to, 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 to let children die and make that our lot in life. And, and this is not about abortion. This is, this is nothing. It, it's, about, it's about feeding those that are hungry and picking and choosing and saying, well, th these people don't deserve it, but these people do. Just being kind. I don't have the answers. We don't have all the answers. But displaying compassion, displaying and showing kindness to those people that, are, that need it, that person that is struggling with, with identity, with does someone love, love me? Does someone care for me? Is there a place where I belong? Or am I just lost all by my lonesome and have to figure it out by myself and for myself? That's what this lady had been dealing with for 12 years. There's no one I can talk to. Everyone thinks, and here's the mindset, everyone thought that she was sick because of her sin. Because that's what people thought back then. You were sick because you had sinned against God. That was the status quo. That's the first thing 99.9% .9 of, of people ever thought. is, lady, you did this to yourself, so why don't you just confess it? And sometimes, sometimes we're like that. I am. I, I mean, I, I hate to say it. 
You got yourself into it, so get yourself out of it. Man, what a horrible thing to say. But I don't want to enable them. Yeah. So how do, how do you... Why would Jesus do this for this lady? Do you know? You know why? I know why. I know absolutely 100% why Jesus did this. Because he could. Because he had the power to do what he chose to do. She might not have been deserving. Jesus saw and felt something go out of him and he wanted to make sure that the person that received the blessing knew that it was from him. And so he acknowledged her. And is there someone you, you don't see? Is there a group of people that you just despise? That you want no part of? That you're fearful of? That you say someone else can take care of them? And I realize, and God ultimately, ultimately knows, we can't fix everything. But he can. And he just wants us to do our part. As a matter of fact, in, in, in Titus, and just listen, Titus, Titus chapter 3, verse, verses 4 and 5, Titus writes this, But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we did in righteousness, but in accordance with his mercy by the washing and regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. See, God displayed his kindness to us. We didn't deserve it. We can't earn it. And that kindness is salvation. That's the right relationship with God through Jesus, fostered by the Holy Spirit. And so, so when that kindness of God appeared, it was because we didn't deserve it. And he did it out of the graciousness and kindness and love of, of who God is. And then I want to read something else in, verse, in 2 Timothy 2, uh, verse 24. The Lord's bondservant, and the word bondservant would be Christian, okay? We're just going to the Lord's Christian. Must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all. And that word kind it's kind. <laughs> it's not nice. The Bible never once says be nice to someone. Look it up. It tells us time and time again to be kind. How many of you can fake something? Fake liking someone? Fake caring about something? We call that a facade. If you've done any acting at all, then you know um, part of your job as an actor is to be believable as the character you're portraying. So you learn your lines. You, you might study that character and you begin to, uh, uh, to talk like that person might talk, walk like that person might walk, um, think like that person might think. And, and ultimately, you, you try to become as much like that person as you, as, as you can. But at the end of the day, you take off your mask and your facade and you are still who you are. As a matter of fact, Diana and I and, and Lana, we saw a, a show at Palisade High School and the leading lady was Annie and Annie Get Your Gun. And we were talking with her and, 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 and she was saying, well, the show was over, everyone was applauding and she was still talking like Annie Annie Oakley from Annie Get Your Gun. And she stopped in the middle of the conversation and, and said, I'm still Annie, aren't I? And she said, I'm so, I'm so in, in, engrossed in this character that, that I, I forget sometimes to be myself because I've become Annie Oakley for this show. But folks, at the end of the day, just like her, we have to take off all, all of the niceties and all the false things, all the things we want people to see and get honest with ourselves and be honest with God. 
because we have to be real. We have to be authentic. We have to be transparent. And we have to be kind. Because see, if we're not kind, then we really can't love. And we know the greatest commandment is to love God and to love others. And so if, 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 if we can't be gentle, if we can't practice self-control, and if we can't display kindness, then we're ultimately not living like Christ wants us to live. And so there's a, big, a bigger picture. And it really has to do with the last song that we sang. Is it well with your soul? Are you who you say you are? Do you truly believe that God has granted you life in, him, in himself? That the power of the Holy Spirit stirs in your heart and in your life and in your mind and, and he guides you into his truth. There's power in God. If you were going to heal someone, how would you take credit for it? I got 16 doctorates. I got everything. I did it all. And Jesus just looked around and said, who, who touched me? Who touched me? Do you know one word, one sentence in love can keep someone from taking their own life? can keep someone from walking out the door of a church saying, nobody loves me, not even God, simply by being kind. Or that you see someone who's different than you that might believe differently than you do. And instead of engaging and being kind, you ignore. And you ignore out of fear. Or maybe simply because you don't like what they represent. Folks, in all honesty, in the coming, coming months, we're going to be bombarded with people we don't agree with, with ideas and ideals that we, we, we can't support. But it's, Christianity is not about that. It's about the people. Can you love someone who's different than you? Think of the Good Samaritan. You guys remember that story? Guy's beaten up and robbed and all this stuff, and, and all, all the religious people walk by him, and the, the Hebrews and the, the scribes and, you know, everybody, and they walk by, and because he's not like them, they just walk on by because they don't want to become unclean like the, the woman that, Touch Jesus' cloak. They don't want uh, to be bothered. Oh, there's so many reasons, so many excuses. And then the, the, the least of the least in the minds of the people, this, the Samaritan, who the Hebrews hated, everybody hated, saw this person that was in the ditch, in the gully, beaten and bruised. And he stops on his journey and he kneels down and he he begins to do what he can do. He's no doctor. But he tends to him and he puts him on his donkey or his horse or whatever it was. And he grabs the, grabs the reins of the, of the, of the animal and he, he walks to a place where this guy could be tended to. And he looks at the innkeeper and he says, <laughs> I'm going to paraphrase, I don't know how long this guy's going to be here but put it on my tab. I'll take care of it. He didn't know this man. He saw someone in need, and he was simply kind. He went out of his way to make sure that this person didn't die. Is there a greater statement than that? I just did what I could do to glorify and honor God because that's who I am. I just want to try a little kindness. I want us, the church, to lead the way. Because we're the ones that ultimately 
received the greatest act of kindness the world could ever know. And that's forgiveness of our sin. Salvation from the God who made us. I don't know. I don't know where you land this morning. You know, I, I, don't, I, I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what you're struggling with. Some of you I do, absolutely do. But you know yourself, probably. Maybe we just take a couple, couple seconds and just maybe quiet our hearts and maybe bow our heads. And in the quietness of our own thoughts, say, Lord Jesus, thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me life. God, forgive me for forgetting how important that is. How gracious you are. And, and God, help me to be gracious like you were. God, help me to be gentle like you are. Help me to be kind like you are. God, help me to show those that are in my world the difference that you make and the difference that you've made in me. And then God puts someone in my path, someone that makes me so uncomfortable and then give me the capacity to be kind. Give me the capacity to love. Give me the capacity to be merciful, to be gentle, display self-control. For your glory and for your honor, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Bow with me. Grace Assembly, Father, I thank you for your word. Father, I thank you for the examples that you give. Jesus called this lady daughter. A term of endearment that she probably had not heard in any way, shape, or form in a decade or more. And he healed her. God, you can do anything. There's nothing that you can't do. And so, Lord, this morning, Lord, I pray that, that in the quietness of this moment, Lord, that we simply would rest in you. Father, thank you for loving us. Thank you for making a way for each and every one of us. And, Lord, I know not everyone here is a believer. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that if there's someone here that doesn't know you, God, that they would, for the, maybe the very first time, recognize their need for you. That they would believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation, the only way to be right with the God who made us, with the God who keeps us and sustains us. So, God, I pray that if there's someone here that doesn't know you, that they would admit that they're a sinner that they would believe that Jesus is the way to God and that they would say in some way, shape, or form, God, save me. God, save me. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget, uh, men, at uh, 7 o'clock in the morning, 8 o'clock in the morning. I mean, I gotta be getting old or something because I'm forgetting everything. Eight o'clock in the morning tomorrow, guys, we're going to have coffee, and, and we're going to pray, and we're going to have some, uh, we always have donuts, so guys, come and eat donuts. Actually, we had cake last, this past Monday, because it was left over from the Mother's Day meal. By the way, let me just say thank you to everyone, Dan and his family, and for, for all of you that helped prepare and clean up, and I will miss someone, so I'm not going to say any other names. It was a great meal, and so thank you guys. Thank you. Um, don't forget, we have another meal this Wednesday night at 6 o'clock downstairs um, if you filled out the slip. And if you didn't fill out the slip and you want to come, come anyway. We'll be fine. Um, uh, we have a prayer time at 11 o'clock on Wednesday. And then, ladies, you guys meet downstairs at 10 in the gym.
for coffee, and I don't, usually there's some goodies down there, I, I, I see, but I don't, you know. So thank you for being here today. Um, we did the offering, right? So why don't we sing our song and we'll go home. <laughs>